and away we go. Hello everyone, wherever you are, we hope you're having a great day. And if you're in the United States, in the more northern part of our country, we hope you're having a warm day. Anyway, I'm Rick Zanotti, uh, and next to me is, in the cold part of the country... <laughs> in blizzard land! It's in blizzard land, Dawn Mahoney. Hey Dawn, how are you today? Good morning! Happy winter! Yeah, it is winter. Right, we're, we're cool out here. I can't complain. We're only 42. Yeah, it's been but, cool for you guys this year, more than It you has. Before. We were in the, I think we got to 28 at one point during the night. It's it's not too bad during the day, but people in California aren't used to cold, at least Southern California. Right. So if you get anywhere past maybe 60, the brains freeze over. It's just a sad kind of thing that happens. They don't know how to drive. No, well, they don't know how to drive anyway. We, we, have, we used to have the best drivers on earth. Now we're, I think we're one of the worst. Yeah, I've so, driven. <clears throat> Can't so, say you the best so we, we we have a good time and actually last weekend we had a guest over at the house which was sort of fun uh yuri yuskov who's been on the show a couple of times he was uh we hosted him for a couple of days as he was on his way to tech knowledge we we're not going this year but he came by and and we spent a couple of days i have learned a ton about russian history so uh -huh. that was actually a lot of fun learning about all the different uh peoples and regimes and and how much they disliked the Soviets for and and everything else. It was really fascinating, um, and we talked about. Sorry about his. Um, isn't it a foundation he does for training teaching children? He does. He's got a school for that, and now he wants to create a university for teaching systems and programming. Right. He has a real passion for teaching, and he loves. I, I almost think he loves teaching more than he does running businesses. He's got about four or five businesses, but. Um, <clears throat> but it was fun. We had we had a good time can't imagine starting one business, so good for him. <clears throat> yeah, starting a business. Well, you have to be partially insane to start a business. And after you do that, then it's all downhill or uphill, whatever you <laughs> However you want to like look at it. The people that were on uh, Shrek Tech yesterday, they're crazy. <laughs> oh, they were fun. <laughs> they were great. I enjoyed every minute of that. But and they, had, a, and they about had about four or five businesses they were doing, aside from their jobs. Yes, aside from the regular <clears throat> jobs. Good folks. Well, well, anyway, I hope you told Yuri hello from me. I, I, I told, yeah, he, in fact, he, he said that. Oh, so, okay. <clears throat> anyway, today we're going to talk about, we actually had a guest, but the guest was tentative and they tentatively didn't show up. So, we are, we're going solo right now. We're flying solo and we've got, we had a couple of ideas. Just know and, I'm a little scared. <clears throat> she's a little I'll scared. Get through it. You're okay. You're, you're Leva right. wants to know if you learned Russian while Yuri was there. Uh, Hello, Leva. Uh, I know a couple words. Well, I knew a couple words before. Literally, a couple of words. I know no Russian. Yes. Uh, uh, I had a friend who was Russian years ago, maybe 30 years ago, who worked at a bank with me, and and she would teach me a couple words here and there, and one of them was dos vidania, which is thank you. Yes. And, of course, I know, komrad. That's a good one, too. But <laughs> I actually I actually was joking with, with Yuri, and I, I said, Komrad, and he started laughing, Komrad, because that's funny. <laughs> so <laughs> It isn't a Russian word. It's just a word with Russian inflection. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we had a good time. We were joking about accents and all the different ways people speak and, and everything. But today, we're going to talk about brainstorming, which in reality means we're going to talk about cooking. And oh. I think Don's still trying to figure out what the heck is he talking about. <laughs> I know you had a plan because you had five or six things you wanted to bring forth this. Yes, morning. and today, so we figured brainstorming is a good one because if you look at corporate America right now, brainstorming is possibly one of the most useless activities done in any kind of conference room. Why, you ask? Good question. I'll I'll answer that one. Okay, you take that one. I'll, I'll take, take this one. one. All, All right. right. If, if you're, you're cooking, cooking something, something, what what, what elements, elements do you, you need, need to cook? cook? Don, this, this is, is a test. test. You're a cooker. <laughs> you need heat. You need heat. You need food. You need food. You need elements, in other plan. words. Plan. Might need a plan. Might need a plan, which could be somebody who's kind of managing a meeting, right? Right. Like somebody a, that's interested in executing the plan. Like a moderator. And heat is fire, if you think about <laughs> right. it. So we're, we're talking some primal elements here. Fire. That's, that's a primal element. We're talking an element that you want to cook. In this case, it would be maybe the idea. 
not your brain, because that would be kind of ugly. That'd but be bad. we, we want to cook the idea. An idea that's half-baked <clears throat> kind of exactly means that. It's not a very good idea. So you need something to make that idea better. Are you okay. kind of getting the cooking analogy here? I'm getting the cooking analogy, <clears throat> and I'm just going to mention there's a question. Our audio isn't good again. Our audio isn't good? No, had our, bad stereo. Oh, she said it's okay now. No, it's Can okay. Well, I'm looking. Our, our audio is okay right now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about cooking. Can you cook really without fire? Well, you can assemble something without fire, right. but you can't cook without right. fire. Right, and it probably wouldn't take, unless you're into raw food, which right. can be good for some people. I don't particularly like raw food that much. but For instance, uh, there's an uncooked <laughs> cheesecake you could make. An uncooked cheesecake, okay. But for the most part, you want to you want to add some fire to it to cook it to to bring elements together. So, in other words, when, when you're, you're cooking, cooking you're, you're taking, taking element A, element B, and, and you use fire to create another element. element. If, if you, you go, go into, into a conference, conference room with, with a whole group of people, whether it's two, three, four people, two people, a hundred people, and, and you're in a brainstorming session. session People have, have left, left out the storming part of it. They're, they're in a brain, brain session, session, maybe, but they're, they're not, not cooking anything. I've, I've, I've actually, actually, we've actually done training for this, which I actually totally disagreed with. And, and that, that was, what if you're in a storm? Okay, let me, let me, let me backtrack. The common ideas about brainstorming is when you're in a session, every idea is good. Now, most ideas aren't that good. And the reality is there's a lot of stupid ideas out there. So let's not validate stupid ideas. Unless it really is just a mistake and somebody comes up with something that people look at them and go, oh, okay, whatever. You're never supposed to argue about an idea. At least not at the beginning. And that's sort of okay. It's but supposed the, to be the beginning <clears throat> of the um, creativity process. Right. Um, starting right. to percolate. <clears throat> so if you do the sky's the limit, there are no restraints and constraints. Sometimes you do get silly ideas, but that's kind of right. getting the brain flowing. <clears throat> right. Though, though, to a certain point, a lot of that's a waste of time because some of the ideas are so far out there that you just go, oh, come on. Uh, I mean, these are adults. They're supposed to be professionals. The, the other thing is, in, in a brainstorming session, usually you need a devil's advocate, somebody to challenge. And the reason you, you want that... Which job you apply for. Oh, I, I, was, I was always the devil's advocate. I enjoyed doing that. Um, I, would, I would challenge ideas heavily when I was in corporate America, if you will, um, at least directly in corporate America, working at companies like Citibank and Marshall McLennan. When we had um, brainstorming sessions, I was usually assigned, and, and I kind of fell into the position because I was a systems analyst, to challenge an idea. And, and the reason you want to challenge an idea is to have people defend the idea, see how much worth there is to that idea. If people throw out an idea and they have no idea what they're talking about, it's probably not that great an idea and it's not really well thought out. Um, one thing that a lot of people do is they throw out ideas. Okay, you know, it's kind of like the old feed tune at a Mayo and you, you, write, you know, say everything in your recorder. I don't know if you remember that movie. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was Michael Keaton in... Um, Oh, what was it called? Him and Henry Winkler. Henry Winkler ran the mortuary at night, the midnight mortuary. And uh, Michael Keaton, which was one of his first performances, was the crazy uh, idea guy. He carried I don't know the answer to this one, I'm sure. Yep, he carried it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm stopping you again. Leva says that when your shot is just yours, there's a sound issue. So. When it's mine? Night Shift. The movie. John says the movie night is Night Shift. Shift. Yep, that was it. That was a funny movie. But in one part, Michael Keaton, who carries this little portable recorder, is saying, wait, got a great idea. Feed mayo to tuna. Tuna sound instant. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and, and okay, good work, maybe, I guess. Um, but, but if you look at brainstorming and everybody agrees to agree on everything and be very gentle with each other, and, and it's not a question of disrespect. It's a question of creating a little bit of fire. You can't cook something without fire. And ideas need to be cooked in a certain way. Um, See, but, uh, what I was thinking about, because I ask people to do, I do OD work. That's the right. predominance of what I do. Um, in an environment where people aren't asked to have um, creative thought or it is very constrained down a tunnel, 
or a shoot on a day-to-day, all-day basis, I do ask them to get crazy and silly, and I don't think it's a waste of time um, because I need them to open up, and um, usually I'm there because we're solving a problem um, or a series of problems like uh, chefs throw things. I don't know if you know about this sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, you know, It's an emotionally charged environment, um, so for me, if people come up with silly ideas and begin to laugh and open up their brains and, and breathe oxygen uh, in a different way, then I don't feel like it's a waste of time. No, and, and, that and in that respect, it isn't. It isn't. You know? You're also in a different environment. You're in an environment where people actually have to produce something. And, right. and I, guess, I guess I should take it back a step. I'm, I'm thinking more when we talk about your typical corporate kind of um, meetings where a lot of people get together in a typical conference room. These are not necessarily operational people. They're people who just get together and they want to make something happen. They're, they're more theoretical. And of course, that, that usually leads to not much good happening, um, either company-wide or because people come up with ideas. If nobody challenges the idea, especially after the initial, uh, I agree with you, in the beginning, maybe throw out any ideas and then get rid of those really fast, the ones that are just kind of way out there. But the problem is, in the boardrooms right now, or in the conference rooms, they're not getting rid of the ideas at all. Everything is, is valid in many cases. And, and you see that with some of the stupid decisions big corporations make all the time. You kind of shake your head and go, what were they thinking? Or were they thinking? Well, then uh, they're not doing the full process. <clears throat> they're only doing the first phase. That's um, right. Or, or they're doing the first phase. But uh, like I said, I've seen in too many cases that they're so concerned about hurting someone's feelings, hurting someone's, you know, Well, feeling afraid for your job in the days um, (laughs) since when did this really, in the 90s, late 90s it began, and it's continued in the 2000s um, about working leaner, meaner. There's one of us to do the work that used to be done by 10, 11, 12 people. That's true. That's true. You know, that there's a lot of culture of fear, whether people recognize it or not. And if you're in a boardroom or a big conference room, there's a lot of risk. And I would say that, by and large, large organizations are completely risk-averse right. as individuals in large organizations. Yeah, yeah. But, but what, what happens, happens then is you have uh, an, an interesting, interesting scenario. scenario. The, the more, more you're afraid, afraid the, the more likely, likely you're going to lose your job. job. Could be. And so as a result, people are afraid they won't commit to anything. And most of the time, the people who wind up losing their jobs are exactly those, the ones who are afraid of losing it, who rather than take a position of internal power, take a position of fear. And that never works. Um, And I think all of us at one point or other have had that until we kind of learned the ropes in wherever we worked. And and then you develop the confidence to say, okay, fine, if you fire me, I don't care. I'll get another job. Uh, Not an easy attitude. That's been my attitude. you know, when I was younger, I got fired a couple of places, and I went, it didn't bother me. Just, okay, fine. We move on. Let's go to something else. And, and Well, there, there's the dichotomy. The double standard still exists. When you're young, you can move on and get a new job, but when you reach the ages that we are, um, you know, I'm still an internal uh, practitioner. Sure. It's a little bit more difficult to... Well, you, uh, you think about it a little bit more. <clears throat> you might think about it a little bit more because you go, hmm, what will I lose if I get fired? Are there other jobs? Though, though, again, I'll say most people do wind up, especially, I'm talking, okay, at the professional level, most people do get rehired somewhere. Sure. It, it's just a little bit different. If you don't have the training skills or, or abilities, yeah, it's a lot harder. I, I agree. And, and a lot of times that's why those people tend to be more in fear because they don't have enough to back them up. But, but in, a, in a corporate environment, or, and like I said, I've, I've just seen this in a lot of large corporations where I've actually been in some of these meetings. Actually, more meetings than I'd like to actually recall. But <laughs> there, there is that tendency for people to have very timid ideas. They're well, either uh, uh, There's two extremes. They're either so ridiculous that nobody's even going to pay attention to them, or they're very timid. Um, and occasionally you get the strong people. You can tell who's strong in a corporation. They're the sure. ones who aren't really afraid. Or they're in the seat of power regardless um, you know, <clears throat> yeah. it might be formal or informal. Yeah, and also power is a state of mind. Right. Now, do you, are these facilitated by a disinterested party? Because that really <clears throat> does make a difference. Not, um, not always. A not always. that moves the process along um, and doesn't leave the group stuck in any stage. Yeah, and not always. A lot of times these sessions are just done by internal people. And in the ones I've been, I've never seen anybody actually 
short of maybe the lead manager who really manages it, but don't facilitate per se. They kind of let things go. Oh, and that is that's not, that's, especially in your client level meetings. I assume that's what you're talking about as much as anything, making uh, a decision or making sets of decisions. Some of those and some of those. But no, not even when client meetings. I'm talking even when I was working in, in, corporate, in okay. corporations or in operations or whatever we worked in. There but was, I think when you're a stakeholder, you can't facilitate a good creativity discussion. Yeah, you could. Um, you're too invested and you you can't step step back and see the, the the larger picture. Right. The one thing I think is missing from most of these sessions that I've been in in the let's say last 10 years is there's rarely a devil's advocate anymore. There's rarely anybody who challenges the ideas who who says who'll ask the questions, why? You know, it's right. kind of like the old journalism, who what when where and why and how ask the questions as to why would you do this? What would you gain out of it? Do you really think that'll work? Challenge them. Put a little heat on them. That's the fire element. Without fire, they're not going to cook that idea very well, usually. Um, and not all ideas need to be fought out. And, and a lot of times they're simple sessions. But when you're trying to come up with something a little more dramatic, something that's a little more far-reaching in a corporate environment, you really need to challenge those ideas. If you're not being challenged from within, believe me, you'll be challenged from without. And well, that's, or you're back doing it again, in like that's what I deal with and, often. And, and sometimes the problem with that is how much money was spent and wasted before you realize, uh oh, this isn't working. Um, we have we have one client. They're a very large client. I'll I'll, I'll leave them unnamed for right now. Um, they they came out with one process where a legal team was driving the sales process. Now, legal driving anything is idiotic, but a legal team driving a sales process is like really anti-sales. Yeah, that that's too separate. And, and you know, we're watching from a distance going, nobody's asking these questions. Nobody's challenging this team. And they implemented it. And within... Now, I predicted it would be dead in six months. It was actually dead within two weeks. But they spent hundreds of thousands, if not more, dollars implementing this with no thought as to what the outcomes were. Well, I want, you know, we don't have to travel down the full no. road, um, but it'd be interesting to me to know what the backstory is and why legal was involved at that level and at that stage. Um, oh, it's, it's, it, was, it, was a com it was a regulatory issue. Right. So as a result, they were looking at how do we make this regulatory issue go away? <clears throat> Make well, it easy. We, we deal with regulatory in every state that mm -hmm. we do business in, which right now is 35. Yep. And um, we don't bring legal in until we, in quotes, need them to bless it. <clears throat> right. Um, and it seems to work that way. For one thing, they have plenty to do because people's lives are at risk. Um, and we have employment things and so forth that get involved with legal. But they, in, at least in my present world, legal is very happy to just take a look and say, you know, analyze at the back end what what are areas that we still need to, you know, improve on to stay on the legal and compliance side. But they don't they don't want to be involved in the development side at all, which is a good thing. It, it is a good thing because at that point you you're free to come up with your ideas, and then from there. Just get somebody to make sure that you haven't broken any HR laws or broken any exactly. other safety laws or whatever else. It would stymie the whole thing if they got involved in language, for instance. Right. And that and happens, and, and that does happen more and more in large, in banking and in insurance. You've got legal teams up there right at the get-go, which, again, stifles a lot of the creativity. But that's another issue altogether, and that's you know our, our the way our laws have gone. I keep saying we don't follow... We don't follow the intent of the law. We follow the letter of the law, which is what screws us over all the time because common sense goes away at that point. For us, it would be such a gap, um, a wide gap in um, education, educational background. If we involve legal uh, too early, right. it would um, because a lot of what we're developing and putting forth, we're dealing with folks with um, high school education um, or the equivalent or English second language and if we involve the legal team too early, I think we get too sophisticated. Um, and that's not anything against the folks that are going to be the um, the customers, so to speak. Um, but it that just changes the complexion completely. So, so really, all I'm saying is, as far as brainstorming, 
is if you have a session like that, assign somebody, not just to be a moderator, but assign somebody to be a devil's advocate. Somebody well, as long as they're... It- as long as they do it with the right intent. With yeah, the, yeah, not, not, not my yeah. audience plants. So yeah, yeah, you, 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 you don't want to, to insult people. You don't want to berate them. or But it doesn't. it's not a bad idea to make them a little bit uncomfortable sometimes True. because yeah. it makes them think a little bit more or it makes them collapse and that's the end of it but you know you don't want to true though that um in an intact work team that does this stuff routinely it shouldn't have to take an assignment that's right it should be people that um are used to working together and that it's safe to say what you think yeah and and then you tend to have a natural devil's advocate or, or you may have more than one or if the team knows each other well they tend to balance each other out a little bit better Uh, unless and i've now i've been in one very large organization um where and we just had a contract there about a couple years back which was so dysfunctional it wasn't even funny and this was a wall street firm and it was rather interesting watching a meeting with six people where almost nobody said anything and then when the meeting was over they all started bad-mouthing each other and go wow that's well, a, that that is a whole. That's a whole other where issue. You can't even. There's no winning any anything there. Yep. You don't even want to be in that environment. I wouldn't think. No. For, you know, for a long time. Oh. I'm gonna fix your. I think that's a time machine. Yeah. Oh. It, it, it's of course the one. I gotta figure out why that warning's been coming up. Sorry about that. That's okay. I have a time machine too, so I thought, wait, is Every it mine? So often it just kicked that out. I think I know what it is. The the drive I had connected to that drive, to that machine, isn't connected to it anymore, and time machine's looking for it. It just like pops up and goes, hi, where's my drive? <laughs> <clears throat> Are there any yes, questions in the chat room? Any comments? I was showing something on, on screenshot. <clears throat> is that Rick Zend? Are um, there any questions but, or comments in the chat room? Nope. They're just taking it all in. Um... Leva asked earlier if I do open their brains when I'm doing a brainstorming and I push and push using creat- yeah. creativity. But I will say as someone who mostly does the moderating and you know, and fostering their thought, allowing them to form their own uh, plans, because that's kind of always the goal, um, that if you don't step back and really, that if you don't do a good job up front of establishing a, a strong sense of trust and rapport, um, all it's going to do is take a bad situation and make it worse. Um, um, and there are and there are some situations where I go where it can't. This marriage cannot be saved. It's too late by right. the time I get there. Um, but I take that read too. But brainstorming should be fun. It should be interesting. It should be exciting. It should be engaging. But you can't stay stuck in the brainstorm. You have to take um, and do affinity <laughs> voting and um, and then t- tweak and refine. Um, sometimes you have to go scrap it all and start over, but otherwise you're always going to get the same solution you had when you walked in the right. room. And that's the problem. That's what happens more often than not. I agree with you. It should be fun. It should be a good session. But at one point when the ideas start really coming out, that's when you need to start challenging to filter the bad ideas and to really try to keep on something. And, and another thing I've noticed in some, not in all, but I've noticed this quite a bit in some sessions and this is a lack of leadership within a brainstorming session, they lose track of what they're actually trying to achieve. Right. And that's really interesting because you can watch the the dynamic of four, five, ten people, and it winds up going off into the weeds. And by the time they're done, they're really happy that they've solved something, but it wasn't what they actually went in to solve. During the 80s, you probably remember the TQM. Yes, uh, total quality management. Yes, and I was involved (laughs) in... um, peripherally in several different groups across time and in one organization they it's a large organization they had several work teams and they got Dr. Deming's theory down to the point of um, asking the people who do the work to come up with the solutions and they would meet and they would meet and they loved their meetings and were glad to be doing something else but they never got past the stage of having the meetings They're, they never really the, the um, facilitators didn't know how to winnow down the choices, the selections, and get to action. Well, that there might be some little things that were done and that as an outcome, but generally speaking, they stayed in the middle phase of that whole right. TQM. So there was never any, any growth pass beyond that. 
Oh, it, it was very fascinating um, as someone who came into it like halfway through. And I, it was two really large organizations where I got to witness this in action. And I don't know if you know, but um, the headquarters for Dr. Deming's group was in Madison hmm. at the time. So it was big in Madison, Wisconsin during that time period. Um, but what, what ultimately, as a casual observer... Um, what I discovered is that at the end of the day, the associates didn't trust management enough to put forth their best ideas um, and say, no, this is really what we need. When the answer came from leadership that the answer was no, there was often not a, well, have you thought about this, this, and this? There was no going back. It was, well, they asked us, we tried it, now we're done. And that, again, kind of comes up with a different issue that in, in a brainstorming session, if you have a lot of managers and a lot of non-managers, there's probably going to be a little bit of fear in the non-managers because they don't know if they're being evaluated. They don't know if their ideas count. They don't right. know how well they'll count. And more often than not, I remember my very first job was at Citibank and I came up with a lot of great ideas. They all got implemented and everybody got a promotion and they all left and I got still there going, what happened? <laughs> So like, well, I think wait a minute, these were my ideas. That was that was you know learning very early on that it didn't really matter whose idea it was, somebody else took it. It's like yeah, crazy. I do a, a lot of listening um, to uh, lectures by Marianne Williamson. And one thing that she says quite often is um, that we think too small, that we don't ask for enough. Right. And so I think that also plays in, um, especially if we get groups of or individuals in groups we're brainstorming the topic of the day or something like that. The expectation on them is to grow their thinking. They're not accustomed to doing that. Um, and they're always going to choose something that's similar to the existing solution. Right. Because that's what they know. <laughs> so that's the frame of reference. Yeah. So, so another thing that's part of brainstorming, and I'm so glad you brought that up, and that is you want to knock people out of their comfort zones and make them think a little beyond what they normally do. Right. Um, and, and you don't have to knock them out harshly. You just have to kind of force the idea a little bit, kind of nudge them, if you will, nudge them to, to think a little bit more about how they can really make it better. What would they really do if they had a chance to do it themselves? Right. And so, you know, I usually start with, let's take budget out of the equation, um, because that's always where, you know, right, principles right. go. um, and that you have the resources you need that are, are, or may or may not be money. <clears throat> Um, and so then what would that look like, for instance, in the groups I deal with on a regular basis? That's true. Then, yeah. then what would it look like? And often the lists of things they come up with are so easy to implement, mm -hmm. um, you know, because if you take some of the constraints away, it matters. And, and here's another thing that's really important. For a company to successfully do brainstorming, they, they cannot, cannot, will, will not, not, should not, not We'll, we'll never, never succeed, succeed at it if there is a culture of fear in that company. Right. And who's going to admit to have a culture that, of fear? That's the dichotomy. It is. And, the, and there's too many cultures with have, with too many companies that have a culture of fear. People are afraid to say anything because, like you said, they're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid of looking stupid. They're afraid of whatever. But um, it could just be a work group specific. It doesn't have to be the whole organization. That's, that's correct. Um, but but <laughs> one, one strong positioning there can stymie the whole rest of the... The organization. It, it could, it could, and and there are a lot of companies. I've I've walked into many companies. I mean, we've been doing consulting for almost twenty nine years, and we've been in just about every kind of situation you can imagine, as far as corporate and even governmental agencies. And you can tell when you walk into a company that people are afraid, or they're happy. You know, it's always nice when you walk into a company you see happy people. Right. And they're actually usually very successful companies because they do foster that sense of of engagement, of creativity, of imaginating things, and that that actually makes it a lot more interesting. But it doesn't happen that that often. Well, um, I think um, command and control. Um, I, you know, Leva is mentioning that in higher ed in her organization or area of the world in Belgium, um, that she feels like she has more of that freedom to express. Um, and safely, you know, express the need or or the elephant in the room, so to speak. Um, not as much in um, higher edu or in um, elementary or high school level, but in the higher ed realm. But yeah. command and control, I think we're finally seeing a shift 
that Fast Company was reporting about for the last 20 years however many years they've been around, um, I have glimpses of organizations. Well, Judy was here a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, she mentioned in, in what it sounds to me a less of a command and control environment um, organization I do a little side work with. There um, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent there. So I feel like we're getting glimpses into new ways of doing business. And maybe some of that goes away, I, I hope. Well, what, what next the, generation of workers. The, what was good about command and control is that decisions were made quickly, right or wrong, they were made. Right. What happens in a lot of companies today is everything's by consensus. Consensus usually comes out with very mediocre solutions. It's consensus just a sad, makes everybody happy. It makes them happy, but it doesn't make them highly productive. Everybody feels like they won right. as individuals. Right. Yeah, which is okay. But you don't always win. I mean, that's you know, a, whole a lot of times. Of, people sitting in that room, they don't really have a, a deep level investment over the conversation. They no. just want it done and, and have it go away. That's right. Um, and it, it, sometimes you can't pick that out immediately. But they got all this other stuff they got to be doing. They just want this to go away. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the problem know, is, if they want it to go away too fast, they may go away with it. So then yeah, you just have to be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, but but no, I've seen a lot of consensus meetings too, and. And I, I usually just marvel at the fact that nothing's really getting done, but everybody feels good. Right. Well, if you don't have your feelings hurt, right, um, and you get to leave the meeting with your head held high, and you can um, go back to your in quotes day job, um, then so what? It be, it really becomes a so what. There's right. a lot of complacency. That's true. In yeah. the work world, isn't there? And, and that's created by the culture of the company. Sure. In many cases, it's it's. But but the company is a group of individuals, right? Sure. So, sure. Um, but but those group of individuals are like atoms, and they form elements or molecules that may not always be healthy molecules. Or right. what are they? They're um, oh, they're like free radicals. They tend to cause problems. They go out and about. I'm well, probably a free radical. <laughs> I would say I am a free radical. So, Generally, I'm rubbing somebody the wrong way. <laughs> but I that, get That's hard to believe with you. <laughs> oh, no, I, it's true. Um, but I think um, it, some of us were put on this earth um, for that. We wouldn't be doing this work if we didn't feel that way and have passion in, around certain well, topics. Well, also, like that's another thing. It, 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 brainstorming. It's amazing how many learning organizations have absolutely do it wrong or don't do it at all. When you really think about the role of learning or training in a lot of companies, it's really to help the company be more productive. And so if the training people say nothing during these meetings or, or offer very little advice from the trenches, they're losing a lot of the ability to actually influence behavior. Sure, but I, having worked in this role for a very long time in a couple large organizations, and having had at least one leader say, fly under the radar, there's always this fear that the budget and the funding is going to be cut because the conversation always is you're a cost center, not a revenue generating center. Right, um, but, but that is the way they perceive it, and that's the problem. Most, most people in organizations see themselves as, rev, as cost centers. Right. But a smart manager realizes that there is no cost center. They're all revenue centers because it all, if done right, leads to better revenue. Right. But I've literally had a boss, I had the same boss for 12 years, she'd always say, um, it, we're always going to take the projects that um, that have different levels of visibility right. um, to the organization. We were very customer facing, but w internally we didn't have seats at any <laughs> of the tables where conversations were happening because she didn't want our funding cut. Oh no, that's a, that's a, that's another that's another conversation in and of itself. Why so many training departments are, are this side of useless? It, it's a shame because they don't rise to the occasion. They don't take active part. And the problem is, I met a guy, he worked at Department of Water and Power here years ago, this is like 15 years ago, whose whole goal was to hide for two more years until he retired. Right. And he was the director of training. And you just go, wow, what a waste, yeah. what a waste of an individual. Um, that person needed to step aside exactly. and build a very strong succession plan. A exactly. And, but, he, but he would never do that because this guy just wanted to get out. So, and, and the sad thing is, it How happened. Selfish. Nobody noticed. 
right? How <clears throat> selfish is that? It though? is very selfish. It's it's also very short sighted. Uh, it reminded me of the show on Cheers, where I think uh, I forgot what his name was, the accountant. Um, had it, all of a sudden he he was there for twenty something years, and all of a sudden they had new management, and somebody saw him for the first time in twenty something years, and they go, "Who's he?" I think it was Norm, Norm the accountant. Norm oh, the accountant, yeah. yeah. I was say, and yeah. Uh, and he gets seen, and they fire him on the spot, literally. <laughs> it's right. like for the first time somebody saw the guy fire him, and right. you know, the so, red stapler guy in uh, office yeah. space. Yeah, that's true. They, and they found him on the bo on the balance sheet. That's right. You know. So. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. It's um, it's a. It's funny, but I. I don't. I think brainstorming is still a very valid form of, it is. of getting to solutions. I think that where it breaks down is that we don't do the full thing. We just stop at the first level. You're right, and I think, and that's part of it. And they never get to really being a devil's advocate, to challenging, to to refining, to really seeing what. Okay, we have an idea. How will we implement it? Well, it should be part of a whole change management yes. um, set of conversations, um, whether that's one set of change management conversations that includes brainstorming or it's a larger initiative that goes across time in its many meetings. Um, but each event needs to have change management in place in order to move past pie in the sky or um, staying stuck, whichever the two well, you know, year, years ago, I met some Jesuits who were teachers, and they had a really interesting approach to, to training and really to kind of brainstorming, if you will. They challenged you quickly. You had to think fast on your feet. The whole idea there was to think quickly, think of solutions, think of alternatives. And it was actually fascinating watching the, the rapport that they had. Now, if, if, do you remember, uh, have you ever seen the McLaughlin Group? Mm -hmm. It's it's a political show. John McLaughlin, he was a Jesuit, I think, uh, seminarian at one point, and mm -hmm. his style when he was younger, not so much now, but when he was younger, uh, I think he's in his eighties right now, mid eighties if not older. Um, he's still pretty sharp, but he doesn't rat a tat like he used to. Mm -hmm. It was very much, why would you do that? Try this, try that, boom, bump, and the whole idea was, and then when afterwards he would say wrong. Yeah, so it didn't matter what you said. It was a wrong. The correct answer is, and but but the funny part about that is with it really authority. He says it yes, with authority. Yes, yes, with that voice, wrong. Um, but it gave him, well, it gave everybody, the guests, a chance to really have to think fast on their feet, and it made for for. I actually did that in a class I taught once on database. Well, it was really a boring class. I mean, we had to do something to liven it up. It was all about. <laughs> it was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> this was database indexing. We spent five days talking about this is a systems class, but five days explaining how to index and optimize a database for superior performance. You know, it sounds, I mean, for, for geeky kind of people, that's, that could be exciting, but the people in the classroom were just kind of, and we had to talk about 19 different hashing algorithms to make the mathematical part of this work. Um, and at one point, I went to a McLaughlin group thing. We went into a whole mess of index number one. Why is that better? Uh, uh, wrong. Next. And so we went to, and it actually got people waking up. And uh, it was sort of, it was sort of a fun half hour of of diverging from just boring, talking right. about All databases. Just foster, um, you know, creative thought again. Yep. Yep. I also one thing I did once in a class. I probably wouldn't do it today. You'd probably get sued. But. Um, I was teaching another class on database management. <laughs> They're not the most exciting classes sometimes. I used to teach accounting. <laughs> so you know I what that's like. Lab, yeah. so. Yes, this is RT. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to now do the accounting. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of what we had to do. <laughs> yep. The only way to visually represent how to book the entries and um, was general ledger accounting, so it was yep. kind of a big deal. Yep. Um, most people, when they learn that I did that, they can't believe it. <laughs> I really, really did. Yeah, I remember once I was. It was the last day of about four days of training, and it was about three in the afternoon. Probably another hour and a half left, and I could tell the whole group was like, <laughs> oh. yeah. "Yeah, just trying to stay awake." Works in my eyes. And, and in yeah. the middle of the talk, I just said, "All right, so now let's talk a little bit about sex," and <laughs> and eight people in that room just went, Dun? "I go, my God, you're back! Thank you so much for coming back to the room." <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely hilarious. Just one word, <laughs> one word, and, and immediately the guy half asleep was like, "Huh? What was that? What was that?" Um, 
That's what he was thinking about anyway. I had eight Three, fully sorry. fully attentive people for about the next hour, and I go. You, you, at the end, I said, "Let me guess. You guys are still waiting to talk about sex, aren't you?" <laughs> they were all laughing. But <laughs> but but it's funny. And now for something really. And now different. for something totally different. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, we still don't have any questions. I, I think we're still having a little bit of audio trouble when you have your single shot on. Really? So it might be why. What um, kind of trouble? That we're so fascinating. I'm sure that's it. Maybe that's it. What kind of audio trouble am I having? Um, it's your single shot. It's uh, All right. So, right, so if, if I'm, I'm talking, talking here, would you, you hear an echo? Echo, stereo. Echo, yeah, stereo. Hold on. Let's see. Let me, Let me take, take a look at this real quick. Because I, I can't, can't hear, hear it in my headsets. headsets. Oh, I see. What did no? Yeah, oh, John says it's not happening now, but apparently it has been happening whenever you're on your single shot. Okay, is, it, is, is, is it better, better now? now? He says it's happening. It's fine now. It's, it's fine. fine. Okay. okay. I, don't I don't know what, what it was. was. I, I am sorry. sorry. <laughs> well, John says it's fine, but Leva says she still has it on the single shot. But when it's on the two shots, it's fine. All right, so I did so. something. I deleted one thing off, off my shot. shot. Now, now technically... technically I'm, I'm looking, looking at my, my audio. audio. It looks exactly the same as the other ones. So I'm not getting an echo in my headset or anything. So I'm, I'm not sure what's causing that. that. I don't well, know. We'll, we'll You're the look. master at that. We'll, we'll take a look. I'm I'm the um I'm the Vanna on the side. The Vanna. <laughs> no. People uh, ask me what I do on the show. I say, well, I sit here and look pretty. That's my job. That's your job. That's your job. <laughs> or something. <laughs> So for now, I will introduce her as, and now, next to me, the lovely, the radiant, the beautiful, Dawn Mahoney. Now, Dawn, sit down. Don't say anything else. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Dawn, is, Dawn is very intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, it's too funny. Yeah. Too, it's, too it's funny. Brain. Well, should we talk about that we have quite a few guests lined up for the next several weeks we do do you want to talk about who some of them are since i don't remember right off the top of my head right now first since i've um kind of been getting them in fact i have uh, somebody else that wants to be here on february 20th so i'll have to try to rebook her for another date uh when i attended the uh, presentation summit last september i met several folks um including rick altman and um charles green the third and uh several others that hopefully will get them um, to be part of the show throughout the year. But to just give us a little bit of different spin, these are um, high-end um, people, several of them used to work for Microsoft hmm. um, or um, still have ties to that organization. Um, Rick Altman is a, a whiz at uh, presentations and assisting people who do presentations to do them better. Great. Uh, he's in two weeks. Next week we have Ruben Tozman and um, Tozman, Tozman, to Tozman. I haven't met him in person that I remember, although he probably was at an ASTD event and I just missed it. But he has um, a new book on uh, uh, called Learning on Demand, and I'm kind of uh, anxious to learn more about that. Great. That's next week. So uh, published by ASTD Press. Okay, great. Do you know if that book's on Kindle? Uh, I do believe it is now. I don't okay. think it was initially. That was learning by demand or on demand? On demand. On demand. On learning demand. on demand. Okay. For the other. Should know, but I forgot right now. That sounds good. Um, and so that's next week. And speaking of, we'll be live. Although next on week we're at a different time. Right. We'll be I think live we're on 1 p.m. on 1 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday. We're doing it on Tuesday, I believe, next week. Yeah. Tuesday, you're just going to be all shows all day. Three days, three shows. That's okay. Yeah, okay. um, because I have to be the trainer woman on Wednesday. Trainer so. woman. Yeah, train the trainer. That's what I hit the road doing next week. So Tuesday, mark down Tuesday, middle of the day, depending where you are. 1 p.m. Um, Pacific. Uh, what is it? 2 p.m. Mountain, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. And wherever else in the world you are, it's a different time. Right. Um, John is saying, I like offering suggestions to other options um, as a way of making team members think differently mm -hmm. about what yeah. we're brainstorming. And that's really valid, too, because you're adding another element into it to, to get them to think differently. Right. I do the same thing. I'll turn something 90 degrees because sometimes people can't do a full scale 180. But if you can shift it to the right or the left, um, 
you know, that w the same idea. You know, if, if, it's, if they always look at it as blue and I introduce brown as an option, you know, it's, it, it's still, we're still on yep. the same plan, but we've shifted it slightly. Well, That's we, a very simplified well, example. Well, we are at the end of our time. And Dawn, believe it or not, we've been on for 50 minutes almost. Yeah. Leva's saying it's 10 p.m. next week, Tuesday. Well, stay up with us, Leva. You can do it. Leva, stay up. It's good you for you. All right. Well, I enjoyed this as always, my friend. And thanks so much for being in the chat room, everybody. Thank you much. And we'll see you guys next week, next Tuesday. Different time, same people, same place. With Ruben. With Ruben. It'll be fun. Have a good one, everybody. We'll see you next week on Elon Chat. Day. Take care. I'll send some snow. <laughs>